Well, thank you, choir and musicians and Brother Corey for leading us in worship this morning. I ask that you take your copy of God's Word and find along with me the book of Acts, chapter number 2. This morning we are going to be looking at the first four verses of Acts, chapter number 2. As you may recall from last week, we are in the midst now of a 10-week-long sermon series dealing with times in the book of Acts when God did something for the very first time. And that seemed appropriate because of where we are currently situated in the life of our church. It's always helpful for us to recognize that we serve a big God. A great God, a God who is able to do above and beyond what we expect. And that truly is the God that we serve. Our God is not diminished, his hand is not shortened, and he is not weakened in this day and age. But the God of the Bible is the same God that we serve today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with that, I, I find joy and encouragement. Especially because this morning we're going to be reading from Acts chapter number 2 this, this story of an outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the church, upon His people. And I don't know about you this morning, but as I'm standing here, I greatly desire that. That the sort of things that God did in the book of Acts, He still does today. And the way that God ministers and speaks to His people, the way that God encourages them, the way that God empowers them and sends them out to do ministry. That is the same. And so it is a challenge for us this morning not to seek to serve the Lord in our own human weakness. But that everything that we do, we do for God, for His kingdom, but also through His empowering. Have you ever been in a place, a moment in time, where you felt the undeniable presence of God. You know, God makes himself known to us in a variety of different ways, and sometimes those ways are happy. And sometimes those ways are sad. But God makes himself known throughout every season of our life. And so my question as we begin this morning, we will, we will circle back to this towards the conclusion of our service this morning, but has there ever been a time when the Spirit's leading you was obvious? Have you felt the comforting presence of the Spirit of God helping you, sanctifying you, encouraging you, ministering to you? Have you ever been in a church service or at a Bible conference where just the, the, the Spirit of God's presence was a tangible thing that was felt throughout the place? Have you ever been having a spiritual conversation with a friend of yours and just felt the peace of God? Have you ever been doing your own daily devotional and spending time with God and praying and feel His presence? Felt the presence of God in such a way where you did not want whatever that event was to stop. If it were a church service, you would have been perfectly happy had that church service carried on for hours because God was there. Have you ever experienced a season or a time when God was working in an extraordinary way? Well, this morning, our text from Acts chapter number 2 tells us of just such an event. A time when the Spirit of God in power meets with His people. The word of the Lord says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Lord in heaven. Lord, we recognize that you do great things. 
And so, God, our appeal to you this morning is that you would do something great in us. We know the Spirit desires to work. May he not be hindered by us this morning. But God, I pray that as we have spoken about a time and a season when the Spirit of God was tangible in a place, Father, I pray that that is true of what we do here this morning. Lord, that we would recognize that our church and our attendance of it is not just some obligation, but Father, it is an act of worship to a God who is real and who is present. And so, Father, I pray that you would humble us. Lord, that you would encourage us. Father, that you would lead us. And, Lord, that your presence would be here. Send your spirit. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. What happens here in this text is the gift of the Spirit of God promised by Jesus at the Ascension. This event is probably the event that most likely brings the Gospels to a close. If the story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a story of Jesus and his incarnation, then this is the first thing that happens to the early church more or less apart from Jesus' presence. And it brings the Gospels to a close, yes, but it doesn't bring God's involvement with his people to an end. If anything, it extends it. You see, this gift of the Spirit, as we see it here in this passage of Scripture, this is the, this is the first time that the Spirit of God empowers his church in its entirety. Empowers them to fulfill the mandate that Jesus Christ left them. You may recall that last week as I was here and preaching, we were talking about Acts 1-8. And that mandate that Jesus left his church, he says that the Spirit of God will come upon us and then we will be witnesses of him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so over the course of the last 10 days, the disciples have been meeting together and they have been praying and they have been seeking and searching for God to do something in them. They have been praying for the Spirit, the one who would empower them to do the task that Jesus has left them with. And I know that I said that this is a sermon series about firsts, and I know that this is not the first time that the Spirit of God makes an appearance in the Scriptures. That happens all the way back at the creation account in Genesis. The Spirit is actively participating with the people of God throughout all of the Bible world. But the way in which he participates is somewhat different. You see, in the Old Testament, there are many references that speak to the presence of God dwelling with and among his people. That the Spirit of God's presence is something that is there and reminds them that God is dwelling with them. But the New Testament brings about something different because we are promised that the Spirit of God would dwell in us. There are times when the Spirit comes upon people in the Old Testament to perform an extraordinary spiritual task. We find this with the prophets. The Spirit of God coming upon them and giving them the words to proclaim. We find this in the book of Judges where the Spirit of God comes upon these judges and empowers them to accomplish the work that God has given them. We find the Spirit of God coming upon Joseph, coming upon the craftsmen who built the tabernacle. We find the Spirit of God coming upon Moses. And figure after figure after figure in the Old Testament experience the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God is not dwelling in all people, it would seem. Because Moses himself writes in Numbers chapter number 11, and he desires a time in the future when the Spirit of God would be upon all people. That he is looking around at the world and he sees the Spirit of God at work and he desires that the Spirit would embolden and indwell and help and encourage all. The Spirit's active in the Old Testament. 
Spirit's active in the New Testament. This is no clearly, this is clearly demonstrated for us in, in the picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus walks by the Spirit. He is led by the Spirit. In fact, at various times in Luke's gospel, he mentions of Jesus that he is full of the Holy Spirit, that he is led by the Spirit, and he is said to have come in the power of the Spirit. That Jesus' incarnation is an incarnation where he is walking with the Spirit. In fact, when Jesus begins his public ministry, it is not lost on us that he begins in the synagogue in Nazareth by reading a passage of scripture from Isaiah chapter number 61 where he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he says to the crowd assembled there in the synagogue, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of God rested upon Christ. You see, in the incarnation, Jesus relied upon the Spirit. Now I am fully aware that in the incarnation, Jesus is still God. The second person of the Trinity, the the divine son. And that he in the incarnation is man and he is God. But the way that he accomplishes his ministry, the scripture tells us, is not through his own power, but through the power of the spirit, which is fascinating. What that means for us is that Jesus... Jesus ministered the same way that we minister. How is it that Jesus grew in wisdom? How is it that Jesus suffered injustice with grace? How is it that Jesus loved his enemies? How is it that Jesus avoided temptation? He did so the same way that we do, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is active in Old and New Testament. And so the the Spirit's coming, the Spirit's mere presence, that is not what is the first. That's not what is unique about this passage of Scripture. What is unique is that this is the first time that the Spirit of God is poured out not on a select few, not on just leaders and prophets and kings, but that the Spirit of God is poured out upon all people. That all of the people who are assembled there together praying and seeking for something from God receive the Spirit. The Spirit is poured out upon all people who follow Jesus and he does not leave. No, the Spirit empowers the people of God to accomplish the mission that Jesus has left them with. And here's the thing about the mission that Jesus has left us with. It does not have an ending until Christ returns. That we have been empowered to do a mission that is ongoing. That we have been given the ability through the Spirit of God to accomplish the gospel message. Taking it out throughout the world. And the Spirit is with us. Now we may be sitting here this morning and you say, now wait a second, let's just back up a minute because you've lost me. If we begin at the basics, who is the Spirit? That might be a helpful place for us to start because I find that as we discuss the Trinity and we talk about the Father and we talk about the Son and we talk about the Spirit, that it is by far the Spirit who is least relatable to us in some ways or most confusing. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that we understand what it means to be a father. We understand what it means to be a son. But as far as what it means to be a spirit, that's something a little bit more complicated for us. And because of that, so many people want to relegate the spirit and his work to simply emotional feeling or a spiritual force. But that's not the spirit. The spirit is a person. The spirit is God. Divinity 
dwelling with humanity. When we're speaking about the Spirit, we are not just talking about something that you feel. Being in the Spirit doesn't just mean being happy. But it's being in the presence of God. And the Spirit has come to us, the New Testament church, and is present in all believers. And there are times in Scripture and there are times outside of Scripture we can see the Spirit working in a supernaturally empowering way upon His people. That the Spirit of God has come in this particular story in Acts chapter number 2 to inaugurate the church age. To strengthen His people to do the ministry that is before them. And it is the power of the Spirit of God that is the ongoing power in which we accomplish the ministry Christ has left us. See the words of Jesus in John chapter number 15. He says, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So as we're thinking about the Spirit, Dear brothers and sisters, my desire is to see the Spirit work within us. For Him to work within me, and to work within you, and to work within us corporately as a body of believers here gathered in this place. But how does the Spirit of God work? What exactly does that look like? Well, there are three things from this passage of Scripture that I want to point out. The first thing is that the Spirit moves where people are prepared. The Spirit moves where people are prepared. The first thing that I want to mention is incredibly important is that the Spirit of God moves among believers. The Spirit of God's presence is promised for those who have put their faith in Christ and not to the broader world. That if your faith is in Jesus, then you have been given the gift of the Spirit. Yeah, the presence of God is with us, but not with the world that exists outside the covenant of faith. This is why Jesus says in John 14, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and then I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Apostle Paul continues that sort of teaching in Romans chapter number 8, where he tells us that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit speaks to us as followers of Christ, that His presence is in our life, that we are experiencing Him. Which brings us back to the very first thing we talked about. Because when I began this sermon, I asked you if you have ever felt the presence of the Spirit of God. And if your answer to that was no, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. I have never experienced the the drawing, the conviction, the, the, the work of God within my life. I don't know what that's like. Well, then that leads us to ask ourselves the question, do we not know the Spirit because we do not know the Son? Because their ministry and mission are tied up together. It is the Spirit who bears witness about Jesus. And if you think about your life and you realize that I have never experienced that, I don't know what that is like. I, I've never known the Spirit to speak to me, to draw me, to move me, that my life has felt like a big, giant, cosmic silence in that regard. Well, here's the thing. There's good news for us this morning. We can know the Son, and we can have the Spirit Because one of the primary ways that the Spirit works upon people is by unveiling to us the deep condition of need that we have. 
John 16, 8 tells us that when he comes, he will, this is the Spirit, convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When the Spirit comes, he will come to convict us concerning our sin. He will come to start picking those holes in our self-righteousness. That the Spirit of God will move within our hearts and He will tell us of our own depravity. That He will speak to us about our deep and abiding need for salvation that cannot be found in our own goodness. The Spirit will work upon us in that way so that He draws us to the Son. That He speaks to us of righteousness and of judgment. In fact, if you continue going through Acts chapter number 2 and you read through the sermon that the Apostle Peter is getting ready to preach here at Pentecost, he preaches about Jesus and his death and his resurrection and the need to believe in him for salvation. And when he gets to the conclusion of that sermon, the crowds go, what do we do now? And his response to that is, repent. Believe, and you will be given the Spirit. It is the Spirit who guides us into all truth. And as you're hearing that, that may not be your story this morning. You may not have experienced that. Well, at the conclusion of this sermon, if that is your story, That you are under the conviction of the Spirit. That you are feeling the weight of your sin. That you fear that you are under judgment. That the Spirit of God is teaching you and leading you and convicting you. If that is you, at the conclusion of this sermon, there's going to be an opportunity for you to respond. To hear what the Spirit is doing and be obedient to it. And to come to Jesus. The Spirit moves where people are prepared. He moves within the hearts of believers. But He also moves among those who are prepared to experience His working in a deeper way. Did you notice what the disciples are doing in this passage of Scripture? This is ten days after the ascension of Jesus. He He has gone back up into heaven, and the disciples are continually gathering together because they said, Jesus has promised us something. Jesus has said he will give us his spirit. He has told us that a comforter is coming. He has told us there will be one who will give us power to proclaim his name throughout the entirety of the world, and so they are showing up and they are preparing themselves for that eventuality. Jesus said this is going to happen. And they're preparing their hearts for it. They're together. They are praying. And they are eagerly anticipating the fulfillment of Jesus' plan. And outside the doors of this room where they're gathered, it is chaos. This is Pentecost. The Feast of Weeks. Perhaps the largest of all of the pilgrimage festivals of the Jews. And the city of Jerusalem in this moment has swelled to more than twice its normal size. And there are people everywhere. It's chaotic. But where the people of God are, it's calm. It's focused. This is a group of people whose hearts Desire the same thing. I know this about church people. And I can say this because I am church people. Sometimes my attitude stinks. Sometimes, I am not where I need to be. I haven't been in God's word like I ought to be, or I haven't been praying like I ought to be. I haven't been 
speaking to godly people and letting them minister to me in my life like I ought to. I haven't been going to church like I should have been. I, I'm in these moments where I am just, yes, I'm a believer. But I don't appear to be seeking after the Spirit's work in some deeper way. And I have been known to hinder the work of the Spirit because my attitude stinks. Because I doubt. I mean, how often, dear church, do we have not because we ask not? How often do we not experience an outpouring of the Spirit of God because we do not come to church prepared for it? And we may say, yes, we want the Spirit of God to do something, but we are not on our face before God. Saying, God, please, in your faithfulness, send the Spirit upon us. God, do something within us that only you can do. And we hear about the Spirit being poured out somewhere else. And here is this church or this community of faith and they are growing and they are thriving and it seems like no matter what they do, it's successful. And we wish that happened here, but we don't expect it because we haven't prepared our hearts for it. I'm going to encourage you to do something for me, dear Christian. If you are a member of Parkway Baptist Church, I want you to change the way that you pray. Now, I'm going to take for granted that you pray. But as you pray, I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit to be at work in this church in a real and tangible way. That what we do here in this place is not just business as usual. Not just routine that we would not be satisfied with just doing church the way that we've always done church. But that we would pray that God does something so big here that there is no possible way that we could point to a pastor, a leadership team, a program, or any person in this church and say, look at what Brother Jesse did. No, but that God would do something so big that we would have no choice but to simply throw up our hands and say, can you believe what God is doing? Because I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I mess up all the time. And I'm not the smartest guy. That if God chooses to use me, it's because God's doing something. It's more in spite of me sometimes. It's not because I'm doing something, but because God is doing something. What I want from our church is that we would pray big prayers because we serve a big God. We are asking for God to do something in us outside the normal, something that is unusual, something that is different. And we know to pray like this. Because the second thing that the Spirit's presence teaches us in this passage of Scripture. Yes, the Spirit moves where the hearts of people are prepared. But when the Spirit works, expect some dramatic things to happen. When we just let loose and we let God do what God wants to do within us, we will be amazed at how God works. I mean, here in this passage of Scripture, the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, I mean, there was no doubt when we read this passage of scripture, there is no doubt in the hearts of these disciples that what happens is God. Look at what God does. The coming of the Spirit is comprised of a noise, a, vis a visible demonstration, and an outward manifestation of power. That when the Spirit of God arrives in the New Testament church, he arrives with the noise of a mighty rushing wind that fills the place. You may or may not be aware of the fact that one of these things that are synonymous with the action of God in the Old Testament is a mighty rushing wind. And you know another thing? Fire. It's a demonstration of the presence of God. And they hear this noise and they see tongues of fire. 
And then there's this outward manifestation of power in inspired speech that the Spirit gives utterance to the disciples and they are able to speak in languages that are foreign to them. I don't know about y'all, but I don't randomly get up one day and be able to speak a language other than the one that I barely can speak now. But God does something. He takes these uneducated Galilean fishermen and he gives them the ability to spread the gospel to all of those people who are gathered together for Pentecost. What Luke is describing here, I'm going to be the first to tell you, is hard for me in my mind's eye to picture. It's transcendent. This is beyond ordinary. This is God at work. And while I understand that the exact appearance of what is happening here is somewhat lost on me, this is not lost on me. These people are filled with the Spirit of God. That God does something in them that totally and completely changes them. I'm going to tell you something, dear brothers and sisters. When God does something in our church, it will completely and totally and dramatically change who we are. When we are experiencing the Spirit of God, you know what that wants us and leads us to do? To want more of that and to desire more of that. And a culture of prayer and dependence upon God builds more prayer and more dependence on God. These people are filled with the Spirit. And they are given the ability to fulfill the commands of Christ. Which brings us to the third thing here in this passage of Scripture. The Spirit's work results in disciples who are bold to speak about Jesus. Luke highlights the worship that occurs here in unlearned languages. It is for Luke the jumping off place for Peter's sermon. It is what is promised about in verses 17 and 18 where Peter in his sermon quotes this prophet Joel in the Old Testament. It says, in the last day it shall be that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This spirit-inspired speech aids the narrative of the book of Acts by signifying this cross-cultural witness that Jesus is leading his people toward. And here's the thing. The result of the Spirit's action within the hearts of these disciples, it does not result in timid disciples. These guys don't experience the Spirit and then shrink to the task. But instead, they feel the Spirit of God emboldening them, and they go out and faithfully preach and teach the gospel. Where the Spirit works, we will find power and boldness to live in obedience to Christ and take his message to the ends of the earth. So what should we do with this? After hearing this church, what ought we to do? Well, the first thing I would encourage you to do is to think on the Spirit. Don't neglect the Spirit. Or view Him as less than He is. Worship Him as God. A person. And not impersonal force. A second thing is I would encourage you to rely upon the Spirit of God. There is a strong pull within our hearts at times to do what seems right to us. What seems logical, what seems pragmatic. But that does not necessarily mean that we are doing what is spiritual. Rely upon the Spirit. It means that we will reject worldly institutions and definitions of success. The church is not a business. We do not have CEOs. We don't have a hierarchy. No, we are a group of brothers and sisters bound together in the body of Christ. 
that we have one head, Jesus. We ought to reject what the world says is successful, knowing instead that the Spirit will lead us and guide us. He does this through prayer. What is it that these disciples are doing in this upper room? They are there and they are praying together. They are desiring God to do something. They have unity with the Spirit. Because the Spirit works where He is prepared for and where He is unhindered. That is not to say that the Spirit of God doesn't sometimes work in places where our hearts are not prepared. The Spirit of God is God, and He can work wherever He wills. But we ought to be preparing ourselves. I'd also tell you to listen to the Spirit. He is the encourager, the helper, the one who bears witness to Christ. And this morning, He may be speaking to you in a variety of different ways. The Spirit of God is the one who convicts us and convinces us of our sinfulness and our need for righteousness. And because of this, the Spirit of God may be leading you this morning to a number of different places. He may be leading you to connect with this church body. He may be leading you to recommit your life in some way. He may be calling you to believe in Him for the first time and to put your faith in Jesus. He may be calling you to repentance. I trust that the Spirit is at work and that the Spirit is moving in this place. And there are a number of ways that we can respond to that. In just a moment, we're going to play some music. and There'll be a time of reflection as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, but that also is a good opportunity for you. If you need to pray, here's some ways that you can respond. I will be down front in just a moment. And you are welcome to come down and to talk to me. I would love nothing more than to show you in God's word what it means to follow Christ and to walk in the Spirit. I also will be standing in the back at the conclusion of the service. You are more than welcome to come by and talk to me there if you feel more comfortable to do so. Or inside of your pews and on the table in the back, there are some connection cards. You just write your name and your number down on that. You can drop it in an offering plate. You can leave it on the seat. You can stick it in my hand. You can give it to another church member and it will get to me. And I will talk to you this week. What I don't want us to do is I don't want us to come to this place, feel the spirits moving, and then leave as if nothing has happened. We also have our Lord's Supper this morning. And what a wonderful and joyous opportunity that that is in the life of our church. But in addition to it being a wonderful and joyous moment in the life of our church, it does come in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 with a word of warning from the Apostle Paul. That tells us that because we are coming together as the body of Christ to remember his suffering, his death, his body broken for us and his blood poured out for the salvation of our sins, that we should not do that in a manner that is unworthy. And so this morning we're going to take some time. It's a very serious moment. And this is a time for you, brother and sister, to search your own heart. To find sin where it may lie in wait. To pray for forgiveness. And to prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven. Father, we commit this time to you, trusting in you. Lord, we need your spirit this morning. Spirit, guide us, help us, lead us, convict us. Lord, testify with our spirit that we are the children of God. And Father, I pray that you would work as only you can work. And Lord, if there's one that needs to do business with you, that needs to come to you this morning in believing faith, 
God, that you would give them the courage that they need to do so. Father, bless this time that we have together and prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.